we teach kids eat your vegetables, brush your teeth, you know, but we don't, to, it's not as much of a, there's not a lot of push to, to teach kids about feelings. All right, welcome back to You Need a Counselor podcast. My name is Julie Johnson. I'm the president and founder of Heart and Solutions here in Iowa. Uh, we are still doing outpatient mental health counseling in each of our nine office locations. Uh, we are all also doing uh, telehealth services. So if you're listening to this and you're interested in telehealth, give us a call if you're anywhere in Iowa. And I'm Krista. I am the vice president at Heart and Solutions in charge of our behavioral health department. So we also work with children ages four to 18 in home, in office, or in school or telehealth right now as well on different behavioral skills. And this is our podcast, You Need a Counselor. So we are designed for people curious about counseling, but who have barriers keeping them from experiencing the benefits of counseling. Our mission is to share stories about counseling, good, bad, and indifferent, and spread the message that everyone can benefit from mental health and behavioral health counseling services. Yeah, so we post on Sunday nights at 5 p.m. So we really recommend batch up any unpleasant task you don't like. Um, I do not like putting away laundry. <laughs> I will batch that up all week long uh, to Sunday nights and then do it on Sunday nights while I listen to the podcast because I do like having clean clothes to wear uh, on Monday <laughs> mornings. So if there's an unpleasant task you don't like, batch that all up for the week and go ahead and give us a listen on Sunday nights while you're doing that unpleasant task. Uh, that'll give you that entire week to call your counselor, mm -hmm. uh, get in touch with a counselor, get scheduled with a counselor or contact your counselor if you haven't seen them for a while. All right. So today we have a guest coming to us from Chicago, uh, a fellow Midwesterner. Coming from Chicago, we've got Emily Gableman. Hi, Emily. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm going to brag a little bit on Emily. So Emily is an outpatient mental health counselor in Chicago. Um, so she has previously worked with uh, children, adults, families, couples uh, that have experienced trauma. Um, she also leads a group on women's sexuality. And she currently is doing, uh, is working out of the Chicago Center for relationship counseling in Chicago. Um, so if you are in that area and looking to do some work there, Emily is, is your person. Uh, and Emily also does a podcast called Just Mental Health with Steph and M. Um, and that is where they discuss social justice and mental health issues. Um, so really, really interesting concept for a podcast. I'm very interested in hearing more about that. So welcome, Emily. Thanks so much for being here. Can you tell us more about Just Mental Health with Steph and M? I'm assuming you're the M in that version. <laughs> I am, yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so we I do the podcast with um, my friend and colleague, Stephanie. Um, so we, uh, we talk about mental health or social justice lens. So that's where the name comes from. Just mental health, social justice. Um, I didn't even thanks. know that. <laughs> yeah. We just had to explain cause it's not, it's not always super clear. Um, yeah. So we, we discuss, um, some issues that you would typically think are only mental health issues, but then we put kind of a social justice spin on it. Um, or some, social justice issues that we put a mental health spin on. Um, so for example, um, we just did an episode where we had another colleague of ours who specializes in OCD. Mm -hmm. Um, and we talked all about like what OCD is misconceptions, you know, it's more than just like, I want everything to be clean and orderly. You know, that's like the kind of like the societal understanding of OCD, um, but it's much more than that. Um, we talk about treatments and then we also talk about barriers to treatments and um, the social issues that are involved in that and how certain genders or races are more likely to be overlooked or more likely to be over or under diagnosed. Let's see, we've done uh, racism of Asian Americans was um, another episode. Um, 
and we had my um, an Asian American friend who's also very um, knowledgeable and um, active in like mental health community. Um, so she talked about her experience of racism, and then we also talked about how that impacts a person's mental health um, and how they can seek seek help. So yeah, that's kind of the gist. <laughs> Wow, very interesting. So with with OCD, I love what you're talking about in terms of the kind of societal's understanding of, mm-hmm. you know, uh, some movies that come to mind are like As Good As It Gets <laughs> um, or the TV show Monk, right? Those are kind of what is public facing um, mm-hmm. about that diagnosis. And so sometimes people will say, man, I got this diagnosis, but I don't, I don't clean a lot. <laughs> um, or I don't wash my hands all the time. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, that's not the diagnosis. It's just what's entertaining for television and television. Movies, right? because, yeah. Yeah. Because we can't really, those, those intrusive thoughts that come with it, those are much more difficult to portray on a screen, right? Through a script um, than they are when you're experiencing them in real life. So um, I love that distinction that you're making. And can you tell us more about kind of those social justice uh, components for that diagnosis? Because that's really very interesting. Yeah. Um, so kind of with, um, with most mental health, you know, any sort of healthcare, um, lower income communities ha- don't have as easy or, you know, easy access to, um, to mental health. So, um, to mental health services. So, um, you know, people who struggle with OCD that are from these communities, often communities of color, um, are less likely to get, to get help. Um, also like cultural stigma, um, certain cultures, you know, having a mental illness is much more stigmatized. Um, there's also the gender, um, like having a mental illness is, you know, a bit more stigmatized for men. Men are less likely to seek, to seek services. Um, you know, women are expected to be like nurturing and caretakers and like be the one that always like has it all together um so if you see a woman that's like constantly checking if her kids are okay you know that's gonna more likely go unnoticed than let's say a man who's constantly checking if his kids are okay because that's less expected of a man um so he probably would more likely that would probably more likely catch people's attention and be like, are you having intrusive thoughts about something happening to your child? Whereas a woman is like expected. Um, So that's kind of what comes to mind. Um, You know, I think a lot of another kind of um, issue with mental health treatment in general, um, a lot of the treatments were created with, you know, middle-class white people in, you know, in mind. Um, and they're often not really tailored to those cultural, um, differences that I mentioned. Um, it's like ERP exposure response prevention, you know, the gold standard for OCD treatment. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot that's left out of that, that might not be, um, as well catered to different populations. So, yeah. So, I mean, I keep coming back to the title of the podcast. So just mental health. I love that little twist on it. Uh, right. So it, it is a, it is mental health that is just, that is fair, um, mm-hmm. that involves just justice and equal, equal fair treatment, which isn't always homogenous treatment, um, but it's just treatment. And I, I mm-hmm. love that perspective on it. Um, and so for, for people who are kind of thinking or, you know, thinking about, well, maybe I, maybe I would benefit from counseling, right? Maybe I would. Uh, do you find that these kinds of, these kinds of uh, standards and, and society expectations really get in the way of people even feeling comfortable to start counseling? Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. I mean, as white women are the most likely to, to see counseling because they are the least stigmatized, you know, it's least stigmatized for them and they are also more likely to have access. Um, but yeah, there's definitely the stigma and all, all the barriers, um, that, you know, will make people be like, if I seek, 
if I see counseling, does that mean something's wrong with me? Does that make me weak? Does that make me broken? Um, I'm not bad enough to need counseling. Um, you know, and a lot of times people think it's like, you have to have some sort of severe, something severe to, to seek counseling. And it's, um, you know, it's not, it can just be, you know, you can be like pretty well functioning and just, you know, need, um, some support or some, you know, just someone to seek counseling for, for something that might not necessarily be, um, like a major issue. Um, so yeah, I would definitely, you know, encourage people to kind of look at those, um, those barriers and those stigmas, you know, whether those are just societal, like ideas or, um, ideologies or whether they're like actual, you know, financial or kind of systemic barriers to really look at those and see if there's a way that you can work through that. I think sometimes, you know, there are, if there are cultural challenges, cultural uh, conflicts between societal's expectation of how a person should act or think um, or, or be, um, and then some of those, those cultural pieces actually get um, symptomized, right? <laughs> they get uh, diagnosed um, when, when really those are cultural aspects. I think that um, you know, sometimes people will go, well, I'm having distress and, you know, that's, a, that's a pretty good sign, right? I'm having distress that, okay, maybe I can benefit from counseling, but I think that sometimes that distress gets, I think, because sometimes we understand the, those multicultural, um, barriers, right. Or those cultural barriers to counseling, sometimes the understanding of that barrier can become a barrier itself, right? Because if I, if I say, well, I'm having distress, but it's not because of me, right? It's because like society has this standard for women, right? It's because society expects this of me um, as, as a mom or society expects this of me uh, as an Asian American or as an adoptee, right? Or as a mental health counselor, <laughs> society expects these things of me. And so that's where the discord comes in, right? It's not that I on an island by myself would have distress, right? It's that my interaction with society and then my clash with some of those societal norms is what's causing my distress. And sometimes when people kind of see that, that can actually in itself, that understanding can be a barrier because then it's like, well, I don't need counseling. Society <laughs> needs counseling, uh -huh. right? Which is true, but those kinds of bigger picture social injustices, right? To systemic issues, are, are they, they take a lot longer to process. And so what I love about individual counseling is that, yeah, individual counseling doesn't mean that, oh, you're the problem, right? It means that these things do exist. They do mm -hmm. cause uh, challenges and, and discomfort for us because of that clash, right? Between what, what life is, right? And those, those cultural expectations um, and standards. And we still need to be able to cope with that, you know, mm -hmm. as individuals, we need to be able to go, yep, that's the case. And that, that does need to change. And that hopefully will change. And maybe we'll see that change for our daughters, or maybe we'll see that change for our sons, right. In, in our lifetimes. Right. And maybe we won't see that change, but in the meantime, we've got to be able to have peace in our lives. And so if that mm -hmm. means coping with an unjust system, but still being able to function and still being able to cope with those things, knowing and acknowledging that it's unjust, mm -hmm. we, we still have some power there. Um, and I think that sometimes that can be a barrier. Does that make sense? Do you, do you, do you notice that um, in your practice or on your podcast ever? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that's a really good point that learning to kind of, I mean, I guess acceptance to an extent, you know, you want to find a balance of like, we need to fight for justice and we need to, um, you know, you know, march and call our representatives and like do all these things to fight for justice while still being able to accept that that is 
our life, you know, whatever, whatever, um, injustice you experience, um, and learning to cope with that and kind of coexist, um, is definitely like, you know, speaking of moms, like I see a lot of, um, women who are new moms that are like, I can't do all of this. I can't, I have to, you know, what about my career? What about my child? What about my spouse? What about like keeping my house clean? What about, you know, and they, they struggle to keep up with it because they're human and, you know, our society really isn't set up for, for parenting. Um, and there's a lot of pressure that's put on women, on mothers, particularly, um, and then they are left feeling like I'm inadequate. I'm a bad mom. Um, but like you said, it's really not them. It's, it's society. It's the, um, it's the pressure that's, that's put on them. Um, so yeah, like learning to kind of grapple with that and like trying to see, like, I'm doing a good job. I'm doing the best I can. Um, and it's sort of like, a burden on you to have to learn, like, you know, like, why am I having to do the emotional labor when it's society's problem? Um, but you know, like you said, like the systemic, the systemic problems are not unfortunately going away anytime soon. Um, you know, and I speak to kind of more like the gender inequality, um, because that's what I feel comfortable speaking to as a woman. Um, of course there's, you know, this applies to any, you know, oppressed group. And we do on our podcast, um, when we talk about any group that is different from our own, you know, as two white women, um, we do try to have a guest, um, so that they can speak from, from their experience. Um, so yeah, I totally, totally see where you're getting at and told, I definitely see that in, in my practice for sure. You know, one example, I I love that you have an episode about um, Asian Americans and the racism that has has kind of been there, but I think in 2020 just really uh, increased and just became uh, extremely uh, volatile and dangerous. Um, And I remember, you know, when it was early, early 2020 and, you know, so I was already uh, hibernating myself, right. And, and mm-hmm. saying to myself, but, um, I remember that a, an Asian American mother and a toddler and a young baby, um, were the toddler and the, the child were stabbed in a Sam's club. Um, and because, this person in the Sam's club. At first I thought it was like, maybe they were fighting over toilet paper or something, right? At the, at the beginning of, yeah. of, that was happening, right? Yeah. At that yeah. time, uh, probably still is, <laughs> is happening sometimes. But um, so at first I thought, well, maybe, that was my first thought, right? Is like, oh my gosh, this toilet paper thing is really out of control. That's where my mind went first. And then I'm reading the article and I realized n- this person thought that this was a person bringing COVID to the United States mm. um, from China. And, uh, and so it was a racially uh, driven crime. It was, it was a hate crime. Um, but, you know, as the mother of a three-year-old at that time, hearing that this mom, and this was a mom I could identify with, right? I'm a mom that goes to Sam's Club with my three-year-old um, and never expects to be stabbed, never expects my child yeah. to be stabbed mm-hmm. in a Sam's Club, just going around shopping for yogurt, right? Um, and so I, I identified with that immediately because it was racially driven. And my mind said, I'm not safe in Sam's Club. Where am I safe, right? I'm not safe from COVID in Sam's Club. And I'm not safe from being stabbed by random white guys in Sam's Club <laughs> is kind of where my, my mind went. And honestly, my behavior changed because of it. Um, so, you know, I did have a secondary uh, PTSD symptomology happening to me where I went, okay, I was not present when it happened. I did not experience this happening, but my behavior changed. I avoided Sam's Club. I didn't go to Sam's Club for probably a year. Um, and when I went places with me and my daughter, there was, there was a good two, three month period where I was like, we're all going to, my husband's white <laughs> and he's tall. And I was like, we're going together, you know? Um, and it changed things for me. And then when that, you know, grandpa got, um, 
you know, yelled at with, uh, he was walking his daughter to the bus station. I went, I walk my daughter everywhere, right? And so things like that are when that older Asian woman got assaulted and she, I mean, she really fought back and she, but I was, I was going, okay, this, this lady did that. Could I have done that though? Would I have taken a two by four to this guy's back? Right. Um, and so, you know, I was putting myself in those situations and, um, and it was one of those things where I said, okay, I can't control that these things happen to these people. I can't control that. I cannot go into the mind of people who might potentially do this to somebody and change that. Right. So I need to do the work myself, um, which again, like, like you said, it's that it's not fair thing. Like, it's not just that I have to do the work because somebody else made a decision. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is, I had to accept that I had to do acceptance work and go, okay, this is not my fault. This is not a problem of me, but it's my problem because it's causing me discomfort. Right. It's causing me distress. And so I do need to do the work. I am responsible for it, um, which is such a difficult line to mm-hmm. walk, uh, especially when it comes to, you know, the these these systems, these lines of thought. You know, we had a president who was saying Asians are dangerous. Um, and so, you know, I can't change that. Mm-hmm. I, I can't do anything about that. Um, but I can cope with it and I can learn how to cope with it myself so that I can go into a Sam's Club with my daughter. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, you know what you said, like, it's not me. That is so hard. Um, you know, we've had, you know, I said my uh, Asian American friend, we've had, um, two black people on our podcast, um, people who experience racism and they, they struggle with, um, they, they've talked about how they struggle with that self-esteem and that self-worth, like, society is telling you, and you can correct me, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but society is telling you, you are, you are a target, you're less than, um, and then you having to like, do the work to remind yourself that it's, it's not you, it is society, but unfortunately, protecting yourself does fall on you, and that is not, fair and having to kind of like, okay, society is telling me that I shouldn't feel good about myself and I should see myself as a lower class citizen, but I know that I'm not, or getting to the place where they can say, I know I'm not a lower class citizen. Um, I have to just coexist with this message that I'm being told that I am. Um, And that's kind of the mental health component of the social justice issue, you know, cause they go hand in hand. You can't have a social justice issue without mental health and vice versa. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Said that, that Caucasian women are the most likely to attend counseling. Can you tell us more about that? I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, so there's less stigma for women, um, than for men. Um, there's less cultural stigma as or racial, you know, um, like certain races and cultures, there's, um, more of a stigma. Um, so the stigma piece also, um, you know, why people are more likely to be, um, in higher income households, um, more likely to have jobs that have health insurance, um, if, you know, a lot of, um, like a lot of therapists don't take insurance nowadays, which is understandable, um, given that the system, the healthcare system is, you know, (laughs) less than ideal. And, um, you know, the payout isn't great for, um, for therapists. Um, and then, you know, a lot of people without insurance can't afford a therapist that doesn't take insurance or even those that do take insurance because there's deductibles. Mm -hmm. Um, like I, I take insurance and I, I have to charge some people like $120 a session, even with insurance, which I hate doing. Like, I feel so bad every time I do that, but I'm like, remind myself, I didn't choose your insurance plan, but unfortunately I'm the one that has to charge you. Um, yeah. So being able to afford it is, um, a huge barrier. And unfortunately there's, um, the racial divide with that, with, um, income, um, also just like location. 
um, there's more mental health facilities and therapists in the more, more white neighborhoods, um, transportation, lower income communities are less likely to have cars, um, less likely to be able to get to a therapist. That's not so much an issue now that telehealth has really taken off, but also like being able to afford having a computer or a phone. Um, yeah. most people like have phones nowadays, but being able to pay your phone bill. Um, so, you know, those are just a few of the, uh, the reasons that I'm aware of that come to mind as to why white women are more likely to seek help. Um, men are not socialized to talk about their emotions. Um, I definitely see that a lot. Um, especially working with couples, um, like with my heterosexual couples, the, the woman is, um, so I do emotionally focused therapy with couples, which, um, identifies our pursuer and a withdrawer and the pursuer is more likely to be more vocal about what they're feeling. Um, and I usually see the woman as the pursuer and the man as the withdrawer, um, cause men are socialized to shut down. Um, anger is the only acceptable emotion for, for men to show. Um, so they're less likely to seek help often because they don't know that something is wrong. I also see less awareness in men. And this is like, if any men are listening, this is nothing personal, you know, I'm just, it's a, you know, it's the way that men are socialized, um, less awareness that they even need to go to therapy. Um, a lot of them are less likely to even know how to talk about their emotions. So they kind of feel like, um, like I do get a, some men that are like in therapy and they're like, I don't really know what, what to do right now. Like, what am I supposed to talk about? Um, so yeah, socialization and stigma, I would say are probably the biggest, um, gender, gender differences there. So for, for women who are, and men who are raising, uh, boys right now, uh, what kinds of things are, are useful as we're raising young children, um, to be able to help those future generations, um, to be able to express their feelings and to be able to feel a little bit more comfortable doing that as an individual person. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what would you recommend there? I'm so glad you asked that question. I love talking about this. Um, so teaching your boys how to talk about their feelings. So I have a two-year-old nephew um, and my sister's great. I'm not, you know, she doesn't need me, but, you know, I uh, also try to help her out. So I, um, I got him a little, um, like a little stuffed animal that has different faces with different, uh, different feelings. So it'll have like an angry face and a sad face. Um, and then, you know, my nephew can play with it and he can see the different faces and, um, my sister and my brother-in-law can say like, oh, look, like the dog is sad right now. The dog is happy right now. Um, can you make a sad face just like the dog is making? Um, so that's really helpful. Just teaching kids emotions, particularly boys. Um, we teach kids eat your vegetables, brush your teeth, you know, but we don't, to, it's not as much of a, there's not a lot of push to to teach kids about feelings. Mm -hmm. um, say also emotion regulation. Um, we tend to, when a child is throwing a fit, we tend to be like, oh my God, they're throwing a fit. They're driving me crazy. Um, you need to go in timeout. I said no. Um, but really what's happening is they're experiencing an emotion and they don't know what emotions are. And they're like, what's going on? Um, I need help. So helping them regulate, teaching them coping skills. So um, age appropriate coping skills. So even a two-year-old can learn how to take deep breaths. Um, at any age, you can learn how to take deep breaths, obviously. Um, but starting, starting young with age appropriate coping skills. So um, as much as you can, you know, I mean, a child that's in the middle of a fit may not respond well, but the more they hear it, the more they'll pick up on it, take deep breaths, you know, hold my hand, it'll be okay. Um, and a lot of people see that as like being too nurturing and you have to like, you know, lay down the law or whatever, but you're still, you know, if they're crying because you said no to something, you're still saying no. It's not like, 
okay, I'll, you know, I said no ice cream before dinner, but because you're sad, I'm going to give you ice. You know, you're still saying no ice cream, but it's okay to be sad about that and labeling the emotion for them. Um, lab- labeling the emotion, I think is, is a big thing. Um, also, I think not being afraid to show your emotions in an appropriate manner. Um, obviously, if you have are someone that doesn't handle your anger well, you know, you're not going to want to show your child that side of you. But if you are sad and um, it's OK for your child to see you sad and, um, you know, if they say like, mommy, daddy, what's wrong? You can be like mommy's a little sad right now. See, my face is sad. Um, it's okay to be sad, you know, and because I'm sad, I'm gonna, and then offer a coping skill. Um, that's what comes to mind as far as emotions. I think as far as the social justice piece, um, that can start really young as well. Um, so I buy my, uh, that few lots of books with strong women as the main character or with people of color as the main character. Um, I think they've done like, looked at, you know, children's books and there's like, I don't remember the statistic, but like the vast majority of them have main characters who are white. Um, Any books that are about like a hero or like someone that saves the day is usually a boy. Um, So exposing them to um, people of all different um, backgrounds and cultures and genders is um, really great um, to do when they start young. Um, We haven't talked a a ton about sexual orientation, um, showing them all different types of couples. So if they see, you know, maybe they might have um, a classmate with two dads and if they ask, you know, there's nothing inappropriate about saying like, some people have a mom and a dad, some kids have two dads, some kids only have one mom, some kids have one dad, some kids have a grandma, some kids, you know, are raised by their grandma, um, helping them see all different types of families um, would also be appropriate there. So exposure, I think is, is really the big thing. I have a five-year-old right now and man, since she was probably one and a half to it, the, the question, the phrase that paid in my house when there was a tantrum was always, do you need help calming down? Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, sometimes she'd say no (laughs) and yell no at me, um, which is fine because I want to respect that too. And so, yeah, if she doesn't need help calming down or if she doesn't want to calm down in that moment that's fine as long as she's not being disruptive uh, towards somebody else, right? So, um, and and most of the time she would say, yes, I need help calming down because she's like hyperventilating, right? Because she's kind of, she's gotten herself all. And so we go, okay. And so then I'd give her options. We still do this, you know, say, okay, do you want to sit on my lap and hug, hug your mom very tight? Um, do you want to, you know, say whatever you want for a minute? That's a new one. <laughs> we set the timer, go, say whatever you want for a minute. I'm not going to argue with what you say, right? I, I will afterwards, but <laughs> for that minute, say whatever you want in that minute, even if it's like, you're the meanest mom ever. like, okay, I don't care. Um, and then, mm-hmm. and then we've got uh, a whole book of breathing techniques that we do. So I'll say, what, which holiday do you want to do? breathing technique on. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I I love what you're saying about that, because, you know, whether this child is, is a male child, female child, non-binary child, um, that this child can have those opportunities, even at one and a half, even at two, uh, at three, it becomes very important. Nobody tells you about the threes. They say terrible (laughs) twos. And like, what is that? Three is way worse than two. (laughs) But, uh, but, you know, just being able to, to do that as they are young, because the younger that they can have those experiences as they're learning, like, what is this feeling in my, like, it's not in my arms or my legs. Like, what is this pain that mm-hmm. I'm having? And, and a lot of times emotions are painful. And I think, uh, you know, as adults, we have a hard time acknowledging that even for our own pain that we're having. Um, and so, you know, we, we do a lot of things to try not to feel our pain, (laughs) our emotional pain. Um, and I think the same is true for children, except it's magnified when it's our kid, because it is hard for us. If we're having a hard time identifying our emotional pain and we're trying to avoid 
feeling it. Uh, it's even, it's like double that pain to acknowledge that our child is feeling emotional pain, right? If our child breaks their leg, we are all over it. We don't want our child to feel that pain. Um, but when it's emotional pain that is then uh, inconvenient for us when we're trying to get to soccer practice, um, right? then then it's hard. We, we have even more reason to try to ignore that emotional pain, right? We do it to ourselves, but with our kiddos, especially because it's pain, it's painful for us to acknowledge their emotional pain. And also that emotional pain is almost always inconvenient. Um, so I think there's like those, that added layer of that, which I think makes it even more important um, that as parents and as community members, as teachers, as counselors, as neighbors, as, like you said, as aunts and uncles, um, that we are, we are doing those things for those kiddos at those young ages so that they can, they can grow up to, to try to be more uh, comfortable sharing, mm-hmm. identifying those feelings, naming those feelings and seeking help when they need help calming down or when they need help uh, sorting through things. Hello, kitty. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then if you could give one suggestion to somebody who's on the fence about starting counseling, um, whether it's for a social justice reason, if, if it's a cultural reason, um, what suggestion would you give to that person? My suggestion would be just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Very uh, oversimplified, but um, I mean, I think it is to an extent, like one of those things that like, If you're considering it, it means you're quote ready. You know, they say like, what does that even mean to be ready? But um, I think that the people that aren't ready are the ones that aren't even thinking about it. Um, So if it's on your mind, I think that means you're ready to do the work. Um, You know, um, sorry, I'm not having trouble coming up with just one suggestion, but like really finding, um, you know, at finding a therapist that works for you, I think that can be a big barrier because a lot of, um, people don't find a good fit and then they're like, okay, this wasn't good for me. And then they don't go back for years because they have had one bad experience. Um, so I guess my, um, piece of advice would be, finding a therapist that's a good fit because if it's a good fit it won't feel as scary you know because you'll form that relationship um and when you have that close therapeutic relationship it's it doesn't feel as um you know because people get are scared to start therapy um and it doesn't feel as scary when you're comfortable with your therapist i love that and i think that you know Emily, you and Stephanie and your podcast, um, I think that you guys are really showing, um, showing something for, for people who might think, well, I need to have a therapist who is like me for them to understand, right? So I'm an Asian American woman. I need to find an Asian American female therapist. And that's not always the case, um, Mm -hmm. that there are people who might not look like you, might not have your same uh, background or culture, but are still going to be able to understand what it is that you are expressing. Because, um, you know, the the Korean American uh, woman next to me is going to have a totally different experience of that culture and of the greater societal culture than I am, right? So just because I have a therapist that looks like me um, or might have things in common doesn't mean that that person's necessarily going to just automatically understand me. It's a process of explaining um, because we are each individuals, right? So, I mean, Emily, you and Krissa, you're both white women, um, but that means not, it doesn't mean that you have the same outlooks on anything. It doesn't mean that you have similar experiences necessarily, right? So um, what I love about what you guys are doing as two Caucasian women on your podcast is being able to say, we might not look like, like a person who might be listening, but that, that's okay. And that, that you can still be that support person um, and that you can still help and that you still are interested in understanding what those barriers are, what those cultural injustices and barriers are, even though you might not experience them personally. I think that's mm-hmm. really important. And I think that's great that you're role modeling that on your podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think oh, you said interested in understanding. 
Um, cause we can approach it saying we don't, we don't know, we don't, we don't experience it, but we are very eager to, to understand. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, mm -hmm. Emily, thank you so much for being here. Thank um, you. if you are in the Chicago area, you can find Emily at the Chicago center for relationship counseling. Uh, if you're interested in counseling with her, um, or you can listen to her and staff on the just mental health with Steph and M. So not just mental health, just yes. mental health. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Emily Gableman and I need a counselor. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Me too. So does Krista. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Thank you so much for being here. It's been wonderful talking to you, getting to know you and hearing more about your podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. All right. So if you have, uh, if you are in Chicago, look up the Chicago Center for Relationship Counseling. If you are in Iowa, um, look us up, Heart and Solutions on Facebook, Instagram, on the web. Uh, you can call us at 800-531-4236. Like Julie mentioned, we post every Sunday night at 5 p.m. Central on YouTube or Spotify or anywhere you listen to podcasts. So save up your laundry or whatever tasks you hate doing. Um, do them while you listen to us Sunday night and we can help prepare you to call a counselor that week and get set up with services. Absolutely. If you've got questions for us or for Emily, if you'd like to hear Emily on another podcast answering your questions uh, specific to her, please send us a message on Facebook at You Need a Counselor Podcast. Uh, you can send us a DM on Instagram as well. I'm Krista Brown. And I'm Julie Johnson. And we need a counselor. And so do you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>